Well, good morning to you all. It is so good to see everybody here. How many of you are uh, either have invited somebody over for Sunday supper or you invited yourself over for Sunday supper or you're planning on inviting? Raise your hand nice and high if you're planning on doing Come on, because I'm seeing some people. Raise your hand if you're going, if you're participating. There you go. People are just kind of shy about raising that hand. Look at me. I'm up here standing in front of everybody. And I, <clears throat> come on, raise your hand. Let me see it. Come on. Okay. All right. A couple people saying, I'm, there's no way I'm not raising my hand. <clears throat> well, let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, beginning in verse 21. And uh, before we get into our study, which is a very, very exciting study this morning, uh, I want to make an announcement. Uh, the leader, the eldership of the church, our elders are made up of uh, myself, Pastor Phil Spagnolo, uh, Myron uh, Sorgenfry, and Mark Bethune. And uh, we're always praying about who the Lord would add to that team. And uh, so I want to announce to you uh, Something, a couple things. First of all, that the Lord is doing something different in our leadership, which we're very, very excited about. And that is in the past, uh, the announcement that you heard about uh, somebody being added to our eldership was done on the night, on the day that we brought them up and laid hands on them, brought their wife, and in, in accordance with the scriptures, uh, anointed them or, or uh, laid hands on them, acknowledging that they were. Uh, accepting the call and the role as an elder. But the Lord put it on our hearts and he said he wants us to do it a little bit differently. And so uh, Michael Joshua, who has been serving in our church for a number of years, <clears throat> he's one of the deacons in our church. He's a home fellowship leader in our church. I think, oh, there he is. Look at it. Look, he's, he's, he's on screen. In fact, in just a moment, he's going to say a word to us. No, I'm just kidding, because that's just a picture. <clears throat> um, he, he and his wife are actually out of town and their family, uh, and I didn't want to hold off on the announcement. I still wanted to share it with you. And so what, what he is doing is Michael is uh, beginning, effective immediately, beginning a six-month candidacy for eldership. Now, uh, I, I looked up the word candidacy and everything, and we tend to think of a candidate or candidacy as somebody who speaks lies so that they'll get into office, right? I mean, that's kind of tendency. But this really describes, it, it's somebody who's in the process of uh, attaining a particular office. And so what we feel the Lord has told us is that uh, in the future, that when we're adding an elder to the eldership, that they're to take this six-month period of time, uh, they're to uh, be involved in every aspect of our eldership meetings and our discussion uh, in, in terms of caring for the spiritual well-being of our church, and then that the Lord at the end of that six months would confirm whether it was a match. I mean, we may decide, gosh, maybe you're not kind of what we thought you were, or he might decide, whoa, you guys behind closed door doors are what I thought you were. And so it just provides that, that period of time of really waiting on the Lord and praying. Uh, the second thing it does is it gives an opportunity for you as the church to be a part of that process as well. Uh, so there may be something uh, in your spirit that, that causes you to say, you know, I don't think that's a good choice. And we would uh, want you to, uh, you would be remiss if you didn't bring that to the leadership's attention. Because we take very seriously what the word says about our call as an eldership to be able to care for the spiritual needs of our church. So it gives you the opportunity to bring that to our attention. And then thirdly, it gives us the opportunity to pray, to pray for them. Most of us uh, know uh, Michael and his, his wife, uh, Jill, and, uh, and their five children very, very well, and uh, uh, their five daughters. <laughs> and so uh, we would encourage you to, to join us in prayer as, as we go through this process of, of really seeking uh, whether the Lord would have him be a part of, of that. Uh, during that six-month period, he'll be very involved in our meetings and everything, 
and the only exception to would be that he wouldn't uh, have a vote in any final decision uh, that, that was made. But he's exhibited consistently wisdom, a good command of the scriptures, and we believe at this point that he, he is a very good choice and we're going to wait on the Lord for the next six months. So please be in prayer for that. In fact, let's pray right now. Father, we uh, <clears throat> thank you for Michael and Jill and their, their uh, children. And we ask, Lord, that uh, you would uh, be with them while they're out of town, that you would bless them and encourage them, O oh Lord. And we thank you for him. We thank you, Lord, that uh, even though Timothy declared that uh, those who seek the, the role, the position of, of bishop or elder, seek a good thing. Uh, but we're grateful, Lord, that uh, when we approached him, we caught him by surprise uh, because he's a seeker of Jesus first and foremost. Would you protect him for, Lord, we know that when uh, we take uh, a stronger position in leadership that we become a target for the enemy to seek to rob, kill, and destroy. And we pray against that in the glorious and precious name of Jesus. And so, Lord, thank you that we have this opportunity to lift him up, and we look forward to seeing what you're going to do. And in Jesus' name, we pray all these things, and all God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> Amen. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand and one of the ushers will be sure to get one to you. Raise your hand nice and high. One of the ushers will get one to you. How many of you are still trying to press through reading through the Bible in a year? Here's another hand raising thing. Good. Keep pressing on. Keep pressing on. If you did your reading uh, today, you read in Matthew chapter 16. And I was thinking about this in the context of our message, the crucifixion of Jesus, because it was in Matthew 16 where uh, we read that they're in Caesarea Philippi. There's this sheer rock wall that they had carved uh, uh, just images and shrines to a number of false gods. And it was in that setting that Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And there was some discussion about uh, whether he was Elijah. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're one of the other prophets. And it was then that, remember, he zeroed in on uh, the disciples and he said, but who do you say that I am? I know that everybody else says, but, but who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was later on in that same conversation that, that Jesus said to him, uh, you have said well, flesh and blood. You didn't come up with that yourself, but, but God, your heavenly Father, he revealed that to you. And upon that statement of faith that I am the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. And it was at the end of that interaction that we read in Matthew 16, 21, that from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, which is where this uh, chapter, is, the setting is, that he must suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. We're looking at the crucifixion of Jesus. We're looking at the cross. Paul who wrote uh, approximately a third of the New Testament, was one of those Pharisees. He, quite, he very well could have been there at that same, same time. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was apprehended on the road to Damascus. And it was Jesus who revealed himself to Paul. And he said, Paul, it is, it is hard to fight against me, isn't it? And Paul's immediately, immediate response was, what is it that you want me to do? And it was then that he began to go throughout, he immediately began to preach the gospel, to preach salvation through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And it was to the church at Corinth, a church that had gotten lax and casual about their relationship with God, and he writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he says this. He says, the message of the cross, the message of what we're going to be looking at this morning is foolishness to those who are perishing. And then at the end of that text, he said, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
if God could somehow be foolish, the least bit of foolishness of God would be stronger than all the wisdom of man. And if God could somehow be weak, the smallest amount of weakness of God would be stronger than the strongest of all men. What we're going to be looking at this morning in these verses is by far, without question, the most significant event in history since the beginning of time. And it is the most significant event to take place that will ever take place from that point forward. It is a message that is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now, there are a lot of people over the years that have done some amazing things. There are a lot of people that have died for the things that they uh, believe in. Uh, Look at what we celebrated just this last week, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, birthday. There was a man who gave his life. He sacrificed uh, for a cause that, that needed to be Uh, brought to people's attention, a travesty that was happening in our own nation that was declaring equality among all people. He gave his life for that, and yet I'm here to say, with all due respect, that it was nothing compared to what we're going to read here. And yet we know that it is foolishness to those who are perishing. It is a message of the cross. It is a message of salvation. And as I think about that, and as I think about what Paul writes, how could such a message of salvation be foolishness? Because salvation is coming to that place where a person truly understands that their sinfulness, that their weakness separates them from their Creator that they truly understand that they cannot repair that broken relationship by themselves. And they come to that place where they cry out to God in repentance, in brokenness. And because God is drawn to a, a broken and a contrite heart, He miraculously responds. Amen. And... You read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I've been, I I think about this, what happened in my life 37 years ago when I cried out to God, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You're beholding a new man right here. Dead in sin 37 years ago and faith in Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, made me whole. How could anyone, why would anyone regard that as foolishness? Well, Jesus told us why we regard it as foolishness. He says in John 3, 16 that we read is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But in reality, Jesus was speaking those words and he was saying, for my heavenly father loved the world, loved you so much that he gave me his begotten son. That whoever believes in me should not perish but have everlasting life. He said, I didn't come to condemn the world, as some would say, but I came to save the world. And then he went on to say, and this is the condemnation. That I, the light, the true light of the world, has come into the world, and yet men, they love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. And then Paul, who understood his grace and his mercy, understood salvation, he would write in Romans 1.20, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. How many of you noticed um, Mount Rainier the other day? It looked like it was almost completely covered in snow. Wasn't it spectacular? It was so majestic looking. And yet... Paul says they are without excuse because although they knew God by His creation, they did not glorify Him as God nor were thankful, but they became futile in their hearts 
And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator. Now, I heard, I heard something the other day. I think I heard it from my daughter, I think. So if I got this wrong, if I didn't hear this right, tell me. Because I, I just know just a little bit, and there's some discussion out there about somehow what, what we do to whales. Is that, is that right? What we do to whales is the equivalent to what we did uh, in, when we were uh, proving slavery. They exchange the truth of God for the lie and they begin to worship the creature rather than the creator. What we're going to read is the answer to all the foolishness. So let's stand together. Let's begin by looking at chapter 15, verse 21. And I want to pray beforehand because... I am humbled to stand before you. I know I will butcher this if it were not for the Holy Spirit to speak through me. Our hearts must be soft to hear, to understand the power of the cross. Amen. Father God, we come before you. Lord, I confess to you an inability in and of myself to be able to express the truths that lie in the text this morning that you've preserved over the ages. Lord, I've read this, we've read this hundreds of times. We've reflected on it hundreds of times, perhaps thousands. And yet we ask, Lord, that today, afresh and anew, that you would reveal truth in power to our hearts. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would protect us from the enemy that hates what's going to take place here over the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes. That we might hear and that you'd give us courage to hear what you want to say to us and that we would respond favorably when we're done. Speak to us now by the inspired, God-breathed Word of God. In your name we pray. Amen. Verse 21. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought Jesus to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified Jesus, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right hand and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood by, when they heard that, said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. And then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. 
Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. You may be seated. We've been taking the last few weeks looking at the cross, the events that were leading up to the cross. We know that it is the spring of 30 A.D. We know that within the last 12 hours, Jesus has been betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He's been by, uh, forsaken by all those who were closest to him and have fled. He's been denied by Peter three times as he had predicted. He was brought before Caiaphas and Annas, the two high priests for that year, both representing Israel and Rome. He was mocked, he was beat, he was spit upon. He was brought, as we saw last week, before Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, he was, who sent him to Herod, the governor of Galilee. He, he ends up in both those instances uh, spit upon, mocked, beat, and then he was scourged. He was beat, whipped with uh, a whip that was laced with bits of glass and bone and, and metal, which literally ripped his back to shreds. And after a pronouncement that he was innocent, with Pilate washing his hands and declaring him innocent for the third time, Jesus is led away to be crucified, to be nailed upon a cross to die in a manner by which the common criminal of the day was executed. Normally, it would take three to six days uh, for uh, the uh, accused to die. It was not, they would die of generally of um, um, asphyxiation, from just not being able to breathe as their, their legs would get tired from pushing themselves up to be able to take a breath, only to, to scoop down and to have their lungs compressed all again. Uh, you get a sense that every time Jesus would do that, his shredded back would be scraping against the raw, splintered wood that he was nailed to. Oftentimes, they would come by when the death was just dragging on uh, too long, and they would break the legs of the individual. But we know that God was intervening here, that, that God had planned this from the beginning of time when, when Adam and Eve had, had fallen into sin and went into this uh, spiral of rebellion. We know that God had, had preordained this time. And it's evident in so many ways and certainly, as we're going to see today, in the fact that uh, from the time that he was nailed to the cross to the time he breathed his last was six hours. He would have been led out of the, the city, surrounded by Roman guards. He would have been carrying a sign that declared uh, what he was being executed for, which was king of the Jews. And as they're going out of town, it says... Uh, that they compelled a certain man, verse 21, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear Jesus' cross. It would have been a cross beam, and it would have probably weighed about 100 pounds, and he wouldn't have been able to carry it. He was weak. He was, had bled profusely, and he would have needed help. And they brought Jesus to, a, to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. It would have been not too far away from where the trial was. Carrying this sign as a common way of letting people know you don't mess with Roman authorities. Well, it says in verse 23 that they, they gave him, which is really more literally translated, they tried to give him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. Now this wine, it was actually 
uh, meant to be an anesthetic which Jewish women would provide to, to, as a compassionate means of taking away some of the pain of the crucifixion process. But Jesus would have nothing to do with that. He would maintain his full mental capacity. So this very day, some 2,000 years ago, we would understand that he was doing it willingly, consciously, for us. Because he loves us. And it says, when they crucified him, verse 24, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. It was common for the executioners to be able to take what few belongings the, the uh, condemned might have. And it was the third hour, verse 25, which means that uh, the first hour was six in the morning, the third hour was nine o'clock in the morning. And they crucified him, and the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. A pilot we know from last week, he, he asked Jesus if he was the king of the Jews, and he acknowledged that he was. But it angered the Jewish rulers, insisting that he was not their king. He was a threat to their position of status among the Jewish people and their privileged position with the, the Roman government. And in fact, they were so obsessed to try to shut Jesus up that if you remember, they cried out, we have no king but Caesar. And so they're angry about this inscription telling the world why he was being crucified for being the king of the Jews. And we read in 19, John chapter 19, that the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate's fed up at this point, and he said, what I've written, I've written. And both John and Luke tell us that this inscription was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, so that most everyone would know that which the Jewish rulers had hoped to silence unsuccessfully. And it tells us in verse 27 that, that with Jesus they also crucified two robbers, one on his right, the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors, Isaiah 53, 12. We know that one of those uh, mocked Jesus till the very end. And the other one said, why mock a man who's done nothing wrong? We're here because we deserve it. And then he looks to Jesus. Now, don't lose sight of the state that Jesus is in, of the pain that Jesus is in. And he looks to Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, this day you will be with me in paradise. And while all that's going on, he's, he's hanging naked upon this cross. That's how they crucified him, naked for further humiliation. And those who passed by him, it says in verse 29, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down now from the cross. We mustn't forget that Jesus went to the cross voluntarily. And Paul would write in Romans 5, 6, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And not only were people mocking Jesus, but look at verse 31, Likewise the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others himself he cannot save. Now, one of the most remarkable verses to me is found in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 10, in regards to what is taking place here. And, I, and if, for you fathers and you mothers in here, I want you to imagine what God is saying here, it says through the prophet Isaiah, yet it pleased the Lord, it pleased God to bruise him, to bruise his son, to bruise Jesus. He's put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 says, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. How could that be that God would find pleasure in what he was witnessing that day? Colossians 1.19 says, It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, to him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. How could such a thing please God? Listen. Because it was the only way to reconcile sinful man to himself. It is the way that we know God. And they continue to mock Jesus. Look at verse 32. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Let's see if you're really who you say you are. And even those referring to the one who was mocking Jesus, crucified with him, reviled him. Look at this quote by John Walford. In his commentary, he said this, They challenged Jesus to prove his messianic claim by a miraculous descent from the cross so they could see the compelling evidence and believe that he is God's Messiah. The issue, however was not lack of evidence, but unbelief. They are without excuse. For though they knew God, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. There are plenty of evidences that God is who He says that He is, that Jesus is who He said that He is. It's not for lack of evidence, but unbelief. The Apostle John tells us in John uh, chapter 19 that Jesus' mother and himself, John the Apostle, were at the cross. Try to imagine the heartbreak, the horror of watching your son, of watching your best friend hang on a cross, reflecting the times that they had spent dining with Jesus, laughing with Jesus, playing with Jesus, walking with Jesus, listening to Him teach and trying to make the connection of what He had taught and what they were now witnessing. And the other Gospels tell us that there were a total of seven things that that Jesus cried out from the cross, and I would be remiss if we just looked at the one that Mark mentions. And we're going to look at those chronologically. The first being, in the midst of the mocking, in the mix of the taunting. Who do you think you are? Come off the cross. All this to do. And the, and the scribes are just thrilled that they've shut him up. And Luke 23, 34 says that Jesus said this, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. I was reminded uh, when I got the prayer request about this little girl that had skull fractures and Anna Spagnolo's friend had to have surgery to repair. And, and I was reminded Shaw Road, I used to travel Shaw Road down for years when we lived over there. And a drunk man hit him. And I was reminded to pray for the drunk man. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. Church, we cannot have hardened hearts towards the lost that need Jesus. Amen? Amen. Those crucified with him, Jesus said, Luke 23, 43, Assuredly, I say to you this day, you will be with me in paradise. And then, John chapter 19, Jesus' mother Mary and John are there. And we read in verse 26 of John 19, When Jesus therefore saw his mother from the cross, from the cross, bloodied, naked, dried spit, still on him. Behold your mother, Behold, he saw his mother and he said, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her 
to his own home, wanted to make sure his mother was taken care of. And then verse 33 says, when the sixth hour had come, three hours had passed, 12 o'clock, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now I want you to try to capture what was taking place there. As I was reading this uh, text, it just dawned on me, this darkness. It's broad daylight, it's 12 noon, it's lunchtime. And there's this taunting that's going on and there's this large group of people that are grieving and they're, they're crying. They can't believe the horror of what they're seeing. They, they thought that he had come to deliver them from the Roman authorities and now it was all seeming to come to a close and in an instant, bam, it is dark. It wasn't like just somebody turned the lights on and, oh, I hope the lights come back on. Oh, uh, lights. Dark. For three hours. Can you imagine what it must have been like, the pandemonium, the the screaming, the crying, the children being frightened? And there's a fascinating verse in Amos, the prophet. Amos 8, 9, listen. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. Three hours, it was dark. Verse 34 says, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated from Aramaic into, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the fourth thing that Jesus cries from the cross. Again, look at what Walford says about this verse. Fascinating. This is the only one of Jesus' recorded prayers in which he did not use the address Abba, Papa, Daddy. Far from renouncing him, Jesus claimed the Father as his God. He died forsaken by God so that his people might claim God as their God and never be forsaken. We find a prophetic reference to what's happening here in Psalm 22 where David prophetically writes, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent, but you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. The word forsaken in that text, it literally means to leave down in. It means to let one down, to desert, to abandon, to leave one helpless. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you in all of this? And it's at that moment that the the most glorious thing to have ever happened takes place. Jesus takes the sin of the world upon himself. Glorious for those who call upon his name. But oh, oh, how painful for Jesus, who momentarily, because of the Father's holiness and his inability to look upon sin, to have fellowship with sin, separates himself from Jesus for the first time in all eternity as Jesus takes the sin of the world upon himself. It's hard to comprehend what that moment must have been like. The physical pain in Jesus' body must have been nothing compared to that momentary torment in his heart when for the first time in all eternity he's separated from his father. And some of those stood by in spite of what Jesus was saying. And they, verse 35, look, he's calling for Elijah. 
The prophet Elijah, he was regarded by the Jewish people as a deliverer in time of trouble. And it could be that when they heard him say, Eloi, Eloi, they thought he was crying out for Elijah. And then someone runs, verse 36, and he fills a sponge full of sour wine. He puts it on a reed and he offers it to him to drink. And he says at the same time, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to take him down. And it says in Mark that, with a loud voice, he breathed his last. But there were other things that he said prior to that. Because Luke 23, 46 says, When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. His final words declare to us that our spirits live even though our physical bodies die. John 19, 28 says that after that, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Speaking that even though he was fully God, he was fully man. Manifesting those, those same senses that we have, he was thirsty. Frequently, crucifixion produced a, a coma an unconsciousness prior to death, but here we see that Jesus is in complete control of his faculties until the moment when he voluntarily gives up his life. John 19, 30 says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. I finished what I came to do. It is finished. This word, it is finished, it comes from a Greek word, uh, te telestai, uh, which means uh, paid in full. It's believed that uh, when uh, papers or parchments were prepared releasing a prisoner uh, from Roman imprisonment, having completed their sentence, they were stamped with, stamped with that word, te telestai, paid in full. It is finished. What glorious words, it is finished. Several months earlier, John chapter 10, Jesus had declared, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. This command I received from the Father in full obedience to the Father, willingness, complete faculties, and then the final cry of Jesus from the cross is recorded in Luke 23, 46. When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. But look what happened. Look what happened, verse 38. When he said it is finished, when he said into your hands I commit my spirit, when he breathed his last, the veil of the temple was torn in two. The veil in the temple that separated uh, the holy place from the holy of holies. That pray, place where the priest would go in but once a year. Once a year he would go in to make atonement for the people. The temple, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite Jesus saw that, he cried out like this and breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now, I want you to turn with me over to the right to the book of Hebrews Chapter 6, verse 19. You're going to go past uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, Titus, then you're going to see Philemon, then you're going to find Hebrews. If you get to James, you're going to have gone too far and you want to back up a little bit, you're going to land at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. And I want to close with this because uh, this series is entitled Living in the Reality of Jesus. 
This was written a number of years after Jesus had been crucified, and it was written to the Jews. And some believe that Paul wrote it. There's others believe that we don't know. Some scholars believe that we don't know who actually wrote it. But I want to close with this because what we read here is applicable to what the Lord wants us to know today about the crucifixion of Jesus that took place 2,000 years ago. It was in that decisive moment which all of the prophets had foretold that God's perfect plan for redemption was accomplished. And Jesus Christ, the perfect, unblemished Lamb of God, He died having voluntarily taken the sin upon the world of the world upon His own body. And this veil that was sitting where the priests were ministering while this was taking place, separating the, the, the holy place from the holy of holies, some believe that this particular veil may have been as thick as 18 inches. 20, 30 feet up in the 18 inches weighing hundreds of pounds. Representing the, un, the unapproachableness of God. And what's so significant about the fact that it was torn from top to bottom is that the only way this possibly could have happened is for God Himself to have torn the veil and we know that the veil it's a reference to the veil that that created a wall of separation between God and sinful man once a year on the day of atonement Yom Kippur Yom meaning day Kippur meaning atonement once a year the high priest would go in there and he would make atonement for the sins of his people but the only problem is is it would only last until the next year again. It was a temporary atonement. It wasn't permanent. And yet what we read here in Hebrews that the Bible makes clear is that Jesus Christ is our high priest. And that when the temple was torn, those priests, they were out of work. They were out of work. Because through Jesus, we no longer have temporary atonement through animal sacrifice, but rather permanent atonement through the blood of Christ. Look at verse 19. This hope, oh, are you feeling hopeful? This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Look at chapter 9, verse 11 of Hebrews. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having attained eternal redemption. The veil was torn from top to bottom. Nobody's going to go in on my behalf anymore, for my son is the high priest. And by Christ, do you see the power of going to prayer? Do you see why we pray in Jesus' name? When we went to prayer this morning, we came before the God that nobody could approach because Jesus went to the cross. Not with the blood of goats. In calves, verse 12, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And then finally, Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, 
by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hallelujah. Jesus' death on the cross provided the final atonement for sin, which means the reconciliation of God and man. It is the propitiation. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Remember that word propitiation, that Jesus satisfied the righteous wrath of God, the righteous indignation of God towards a holy man by going to the cross by an impure man by going to the cross. And so when we read Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's by faith alone, faith in what was accomplished at the cross that we're saved. We believe that he was the Messiah that was sent. We believe that he is the Christ, the Son, of the living God, and therefore we receive salvation not through anything we've done at all, but through everything he's done. It is a gift of God. And the reality is there, there may be some of you this morning that aren't experiencing the joy of an intimate relationship with God. Let me tell you, this morning, Sunday morning's my favorite. My office is quiet dark outside I was just saying oh Lord life is good it's in that moment I just I'm away from any concern or any any I just feel his peace and his confidence that he's prepared a place in heaven for me I'm going to heaven and the moment I leave this if I were to leave today I would die a fulfilled and a happy man because I live such a pure and sinless life no because he went to the cross. And maybe you've never understood the cross, or maybe you've forgotten what it accomplished. Or maybe you've allowed the enemy to convince you that the wall of separation is still there, so you keep futilely trying to do things that will make him happy. You've forgotten that the wall has forever come down. There's so many scenarios. For every person that's sitting here, there's so many scenarios that, that each of us is running through our minds and our hearts. But this is what I want you to hear above all else. I want you to hear it for yourself. I want you to hear it for anything you tell anybody outside of this room about Jesus Christ. And that is this. There is nothing that you can do about the wall of separation. Nothing. And don't ever think that you can walk in sin and have sweet communion with God. It doesn't work. He can't have fellowship with sin. But he longs to have fellowship with a broken, repentant heart. There is nothing you can do to break down that middle wall of separation no matter how hard you try, which is why we look to the cross. Amen. Amen. It's why we look to Jesus. Upon the cross... And what it was that he accomplished. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Oh Lord, we ask that you would calm our hearts now. That we would be settled on the reality that you went to the cross. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we read this as a story in one of the Gospels and we forget that from Genesis to Revelation is the revealing of your marvelous plan to save mankind through the shedding of your blood. God, I know that I know that I know that there are people here that, that come 
They listen. And they leave fools because they don't believe it's true. They don't believe it's true because they can't let go of the things that they're in bondage to. And so I ask now, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would speak conviction to all of our hearts. Because there are those who know you, know the power of the cross, have pushed the foolishness of the world aside and allow temptations of the flesh and doubts to creep in. We ask that our hearts would be renewed in a desire to surrender to you. Oh Lord, if I could take wandering hearts and draw them back to you, I would. But that is only done by the work of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, do your work today, right now, I ask. Drawing people to brokenness before you. Knowing that in so doing, they might experience that life that only you can bring. 